Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, ESSA and K-12 Policy, State and District Perspectives. My name is Allison Klein, and I'm the editor for Education Week. Today's webinar has been sponsored by Measured Progress. As many of you know, six months ago, President Barack Obama signed the Every Student Exceeds Act, a law to replace No Child Left Behind. The new legislation is aimed at giving states and districts considerably more say over accountability, teacher quality, school turnarounds, testing, and more. It also includes what the main architects of the law and U.S. Secretary of Education John King call guardrails. Those are meant to ensure that states and districts continue to monitor the progress of historically overlooked groups of students, English language learners, students in special education, racial minorities, and disadvantaged kids. The law wants to make sure those kids are achieving. We'll learn more in, in, about the ins and outs of the new law in a video explainer that will play in just a few minutes. And then we'll have a chance to hear from our guests about where states and districts stand when it comes to implementation of ESSA. Joining us today are Noelle Ellerson, the Associate Executive Director of Policy and Advocacy at AASA, the School Superintendents Association. Noelle will talk about ESSA implementation from a district perspective. Also joining us is Peter Zamora, the Director of Federal Relations for the Council of Chief State School Officers, who will give us a state perspective. After the ESSA video explainer, Peter and Noelle will each give a short overview on what's on the mind of their members as implementation of ESSA kicks into gear. Then I'll ask a few questions, and then you all will get a chance to ask questions either via the pre-submitted questions or questions that you submit now. Um, before we begin, now's a good time to review some of the technical aspects of today's presentation. Please check the audio setting on your computer as well as your speaker volume settings if you're having any audio trouble. If you're still having issues, please see our detailed audio troubleshooting file available in the handouts folder at the bottom of the panel. There are also some other icons that open some additional feature panels in our webinar console. You can read about today's speakers in the bio panel, click the handouts panel to download a copy of today's slides, and follow the conversation about today's webinar on Twitter using the hashtag EWWebinar. Submit questions for our guest speakers using the Ask a Question box located above the chat window. Finally, an on-demand archive of today's presentation will be available online in the next 24 hours. Both the archive and a free-to-download version of the PowerPoint slides will be accessible through edweek.org. Now, for those of you who are at the novices, we're going to play a quick video that will give you a broad overview of the law. You've probably heard of No Child Left Behind, the federal education law that's been on the books since 2002. The era of No Child Left Behind, a law a lot of people really hated, is over and the Every Student Succeeds Act has replaced it. There are a lot of questions now about how ESSA, as it's called, will work. So how is ESSA different from the No Child Left Behind Act? So No Child Left Behind put a lot of power in the hands of the federal government. They were kind of the big dog on the block. And ESSA seeks to really roll that back, roll that back, giving states and school districts the chance to call the shots on things like testing, teacher quality, and fixing failing schools. No Child Left Behind is working. This bill makes long overdue fixes to the last education law. Do kids still have to take tests every year? So let me think about that. Yes, kids still have to take yearly tests in reading and math in grades three through eight plus one time in high school. And schools still have to report test scores. How does ESSA rate schools differently? Good question. So even though kids still have to take those yearly tests, ESSA wants states to look at a broader range of factors. States have to pick at least one other indicator that gets at whether kids have the opportunity to learn. That could be access to advanced coursework, maybe school climate. Plus, ESSA gives states a lot more flexibility when it comes to the tests themselves. Districts could decide that high school kids use the SAT or the ACT instead of the state exam. Plus, under ESSA, a handful of states can experiment with new forms of testing, allowing students to work together on performance tasks instead of those fill-in-the-bubble tests that we're all used to. What kinds of requirements does ESSA have for teachers? So under No Child Left Behind, teachers had to be highly qualified. That meant that they had to have a bachelor's degree in the subject they were teaching plus state certification. A few years ago, the Education Department gave states some wiggle room on that requirement. 
as long as they promised to evaluate teachers in part based on student test scores. As it ended up though, a lot of teachers found that frustrating. It was really hard to get those evaluations right. Under the new law now, states are in the driver's seat when it comes to teachers. They can decide if they want to stick with highly qualified or those evaluations based on test scores, but they don't have to do either. And what does ESSA say about the Common Core? So ESSA says states must set standards that get students ready for college without the need to take remedial courses. But the federal government can't tell states what their standards should be or encourage them to adopt a certain set of standards, including the Common Core. What does ESSA say about low-performing schools? States will still have to identify and fix the bottom 5% of schools and those with really high dropout rates. Hold on a moment. Has ESSA already hit schools? Not quite yet. It won't be fully in place until the 2017-18 school year. Many of the decisions about how to judge student performance, improve schools, and hold teachers accountable are going to have to be made by states and districts. If they choose to stick with what they're doing now, things aren't going to change very much. If they go off in a very different direction, though, we could see big changes. Great, and now we'll turn it over to Peter, who can give us a sense of how all of this is playing out on the state level. Peter? Thank you very much, Allison, and hello, everyone. I'm Peter Zamora, Director of Federal Relations at the Council of Chief State School Officers. Glad to be here with you today to present the state perspectives on the Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA. Um, so uh, CCSSO, if you're not familiar with us, we're a national nonprofit organization representing state superintendents of education across the country, sort of based out of Washington, D.C. And just to sort of situate our conversation here in, in context, uh, CCSSO and state superintendents were strongly supportive of the passage of the Every Student Succeeds Act, um, largely because it sort of aligns with the priorities that we laid out in January of 2015 uh, before the process really got fully underway in Congress. Um, so our core principles there were that we wanted the statute to sort of maintain annual assessment requirements but not sort of lock in place necessarily where we are currently on assessments, but to allow for innovative assessment uh, um, sort of policies at the state level. Um, uh, we also uh, wanted more flexibility in sort of how to use assessment and accountability results, um, both on sort of accountability systems, school interventions, and also sort of individual student supports. Um, states uh, really demanded sort of increased flexibility around educator evaluation and support systems. And finally, uh, we had supported for more state and local flexibility in the uses of federal funds and the ability to blend and blade, braid federal funds at the, at the local level. And you know, largely the statute, you know, which enjoyed sort of overwhelming bipartisan support, um, largely sort of hit those indicators, hit those priorities for us. Um, and so we were very pleased to see the president sign it back in December. But of course now um, it, it falls upon us to, to work together to implement this law successfully. And so CCSSO has been uh, playing a role in supporting states both sort of on an individual basis and then also coordinating sort of between states. And the, the outline that I put up here on the slide sort of describes our overall kind of process and strategy. And so I'll sort of walk folks through a little bit sort of what we're thinking and where we see some of the key sort of questions from states. Um, so you know, this transition window before we get to full implementation in 2017-18 is an opportunity for states to sort of sit back a little bit and sort of take a look at what's working in states, you know, take a look at, you know, what might need to be improved. So, you know, before uh, state staff start sort of diving into the specifics and the mechanics of applying state plans, we're urging the senior leadership team to uh, sort of develop or kind of reassert what is the state's strategic vision for education and to coordinate with stakeholders in developing this vision. Um, a lot of these materials are going to be available on our website, and I'll have a link to that here on our last slide today. Um, but sort of starting very broad with the state strategic vision piece. 
Uh, and then uh, at CCSSO, we've ident identified certain sort of priority issues for us in areas where there um, are potentially some needs at the state level. So I'll just really quickly sort of go through those. These are the red boxes there on the, the, the slide that you have there. So, you know, assessment. Um, you know, this continues to be sort of a core interest and, and focus of, of states. Um, as I noted, there is an innovative assessment pilot, and we're looking to provide you know, particular supports around that. Um, but even within the assessment alone, there are some changes there. There are some um, new rules that are going to be proposed here soon that were discussed in negotiated rulemaking, you know, rules around locally selected nationally recognized tests, you know, new rules around the 1% cap for students taking the alternate assessment, and so some sort of technical issues there, though. Uh, probably fewer changes in the assessment provisions than, than elsewhere. Um, there's also the opportunity for states to use federal funds to audit their assessment systems with an eye towards reducing unnecessary or duplicative tests. So we're supporting states as they think about that. Uh, the innovative assessment pilot, there's a tremendous amount of energy in sort of trying to kind of move forward in terms of, you know, competency-based or other kinds of innovative assessment uh, pilot, uh, sort of models that could potentially be compliant with the statutory provisions there. So we're providing supports there. Um, accountability, uh, quite a few changes in the accountability system. Um, there are new indicators, you know, new weighting, and in a way a much more nuanced and also necessarily more complex system at the state level for thinking about state accountability systems. Uh, school improvement supports. Uh, this is an area where we really move away from some of the very prescriptive federal rules that we've seen in recent years, um, much more flexibility at the state and local levels to design sort of evidence-based school improvement uh, supports, and so we're stepping up and providing uh, some, some aid to states around that. Um, also English learners, um, this is, has not gotten, I think, a so much attention, at least in the sort of congressional debates, but some substantial changes there. Um, new requirements for statewide entrance and exit procedures um, for ELLs. Also, you know, the inclusion of English language proficiency and accountability uh, is a new change there, likely to drive some sort of more interest uh, and focus on English learners at the school level. Um, and just quickly wrapping up here, um, you know, federal funding streams, you know, they're both new programs and new allocation methodologies, new formulas. Um, you know, this often can be sort of very technical kind of work, but, you know, looking to make sure that states are align aligning their policy objectives with their sort of federal fiscal grant management and sort of aligning the federal programs with the state and local programs. And then finally, teacher and leader quality, you know, where we see um, uh, much more flexibility, again, in terms of how to design, you know, educator support and evaluation systems. So we've sort of organized teams and supports along these buckets, then looking to sort of bring states together, as we often do, um, and provide sort of individualized supports as well, you know, as states look to implement the law. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Um, and now before we hear from Noelle, we've got a quick message from our sponsor, Measured Progress. Measured Progress provides authentic standards-based assessments for all students in grades 1 through 12. Tap into our formative resources in math, reading, and science to help teachers gain evidence of student learning and make an immediate classroom impact. We're building a comprehensive assessment system at every level, formative, interim, and summative, to give educators the data they need to make meaningful change. Since 1983, we've been leaders in innovative, large-scale assessment and are inspired for the future. At Measured Progress, it's all about student learning, period. Thank you. Um, and now we'll hear from Noelle Ellerson of AASA for a district perspective. Good afternoon, everybody. Allison and Ed Weeks, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this panel. I'm always happy to have a conversation with Peter and to talk about the completed reauthorization of the Every Student Succeeds Act. I'm going to jump right into the slides right now. So ESTA, what's in the bill? This is what we call when we're talking about the new law to our members. This is the elevator slide. 
this is the spiel. This is what you learned in seventh grade whole math when you were learning how to do job applications, and you have to be able to represent something in less than 30 seconds. This is the slide and the message that we're telling our superintendents to focus on. And the message is simple, and the message is clear. And it's that the Every Student Succeeds Act is a significant improvement of a current law. It takes the pendulum of federal overreach and prescriptions that was rampant under No Child Left Behind and swings it back firmly towards state and local control. It's very clear to maintain, however, that while in whittling back the role of the federal government, to reiterate that there is still a role for the federal government in K-12 education, but that rather than the role of the federal government being to prescribe and dictate to the nation's schools, the role of the federal government in K-12 education is to now support and strengthen the nation's public schools. And that might sound like a subtle shift, and that might sound like a lot of nuance, but there's a distinct importance there. And instead of thinking about the so, so frequently referenced carrot and stick, which really ended up being a lot of the stick at the end of No Child Left Behind, we think of the role of the federal government under ESSA as more guardrails and safety nets. You have the state and local education agencies in the driver's seat, and should one of their innovations or approaches not get them exactly where they're going, the federal government checks that do remain to redirect them in the general direction that they were wanting to go, but with a little bit of correction. Some of the framing principles, and I'm echoing a little bit about what Peter talked about, but these are some of the, the mental exercises, the mental priorities, the intellectual thought that were going on for all of the stakeholders, the member of, members of Congress who were working on this bill, the Hill staff who were negotiating the final deals, the various stakeholder groups, whether it was Peter's group or my group or the civil rights community or the disabilities groups, these were some of the framing principles that played out in a very important manner. As I said before, state and local education agencies are in the driver's seat. They are driving these education decisions. Something that's very important to keep in mind is that with this expanded flexibility and authority comes great responsibility. I was on a panel about a month ago now with some Hill staff, and one of the superintendents in the audience asked the Hill staffer, what is one of the biggest obstacles facing state and local education agencies as they do the work of implementing ESSA? And the very candid response was that there will be people on the sidelines waiting to see you fail. There is anticipation that ESSA represents a regression back to pre-NCLB and that there will just be a sweeping of certain student populations under the rug. And I think that is an awful assumption, and I wish that weren't true, but we mentioned that so that you can be cognizant that while there is a very small minority, there will be people out there just expecting failure. And just be mindful that as the educators that you are, that you're doing this for the students and you have a responsibility. This is the first time in 15 years that state and local education agencies can demonstrate what they can do in the accountability arena, absent federal overreach. And I think it will be brilliant, and it's just something that stands to be seen. The other thing we talk about on this slide is that ESSA represents an absolute resetting of the baseline. State and local education agencies now have broad room to rethink what they want to do versus what they can do. I talk about this as emerging from a completely different mindset. For lack of a better phrase, you can almost think of it as PTSD. Educators are emerging from a compliance-based mentality under No Child Left Behind to an environment where, by and large, if it is evidence-based and focused on student learning and closing achievement gaps, it's probably allowable. And to the extent that you are focused on building out a new approach, practice, program, or curriculum, odds are good the answer is yes. But what you need to do is ensure that you're being deliberate in researching the approaches you're using. And if you do go, either as a, a teacher to your board or to your principal or to your superintendent or as a superintendent to someone at the state, if they tell you the answer is no, they may very sincerely think the answer is no. But we strongly encourage the good habit of mind of saying, I hear that you tell me the answer is no, but can you please tell me or point me to the guidance, statute, or regulation that makes the answer no? because there's such a big difference in what is allowable and what may be considered compared to No Child Left Behind, that there just has to be some diligence in ensuring that when you're told the answer is no, the person telling you no is able to account for why. Underneath all of this, we can't emphasize enough the collaborative approach that must go into the crafting of ESSA. The success of ESSA 
lies on the success of its implementation. And the success of implementation lies directly on state and local implementation. And we know that local implementation is driven by buy-in, and people buy in to that which they have a hand in creating. And so when we talk to the superintendents about this, by and large, when people are convening stakeholders for education conversations, superintendents usually get a seat at the table. So we strongly encourage you that as you sit at any table that's negotiating anything related to ESSA, whether it's at the local level for your local plan or local report card or at the state level, be very mindful of who is or is not at the table. Take a quick visual look around and say who's not at the table and why. There may be a very good reason as to why perhaps the rural groups aren't popular, represented, or why the civil rights groups didn't come in, or why the migrant students aren't represented. But be very mindful, because there's such broad flexibility in this bill. And there's going to be so many moving pieces that need to be implemented very, very, in a very disciplined manner that every bit of local buy-in and local support will be critical. So collaborative approach is really critical. And I would point to, or I would hope Peter would mention later, CCSSL led a great effort on stakeholder engagement, and it's a great resource around this exact type of work. The other thing I would talk about is that your advocacy matters. Uh, I just talked to most of these, uh, but your advocacy matters. Peter and I are advocates. We found someone to pay us full time to geek out on this, uh, and I have great faith in the work that we do. But when it comes to weighing in, no one is better positioned to tell the story of your district, classroom, or school than you are as an educator. And Congress, bless their hearts, is going to make these decisions whether they hear you or not. So tell your story, especially in a time where Congress is looking for a back pocket anecdote. Why not have it be the new approach you're taking on your high school alternate assessment? Or why not have it be the work you're doing in transporting your homeless students to school of origin? Let that be something that they highlight and talk about. And when it comes to advocacy, please keep in mind that it's a marathon, not a sprint. It's both content and context. What if Peter and I had just dropped all of this information on you but didn't really talk to you anything more than the words that were on the slide? Or what if you hadn't heard about Education Week and they just approached you out of the blue? It's an ongoing relationship, and it's a, as much about the data as it is the story that you can tell in between the data. So I can't under overemphasize enough the role of your advocacy, and to the extent that your advocacy is in addition to your full-time day job, that is a benefit of your membership associations, whether a state or national. People like Peter and I are paid to support your advocacy efforts, so don't hesitate to utilize that member benefit from your respective associations. And these are just some of the AASA ESSA resources. We have a policy blog, and we have a whole site dedicated to our ever-expanding list of ESSA resources. And we encourage you to visit those or email us with any questions. With okay, that, thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Um, so I'm just going to ask a couple of quick questions um, to our presenters, and then um, I will ask them some of your questions. Um, so we'll start out talking about stakeholder engagement, which is something that you both addressed in your presentation. Um, Peter, can you tell us a little bit more about what kind of outreach states are doing when it comes to developing their plans? Um, who are they meeting with? Is there any state who you feel like has been a particular standout when it comes to engagement so far? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so yeah, Noelle had just referenced a document that we had created to sort of help to guide states as they're engaging in this. So that's on our ESSA resources page at ccsso.org backslash ESSA, E-S-S-A. And really sort of every state, I think, is engaged sort of at this relatively early stage of implementation in consulting with stakeholders from really a range of different uh, sort of constituencies. So, you know, certainly with practitioners, you know, teachers, principals, school super or local superintendents. Um, but also, you know, engaging forcefully with the civil rights community and disability rights organizations. And, you know, one of the themes in our sort of new guide uh, is around sort of expanding the list of stakeholders with whom SEAs sort of have traditionally consulted, sort of looking through social media and other kinds of means to really sort of have this be a, a public conversation in the states as to sort of where are we now, where do we want to go, how does ever as ESSA sort of serve as a leverage point. Um, so in our guide, we have a number of different examples of sort of leading states in this area, 
Uh, one state that I would call attention to is, is Pennsylvania, which I think has um, been a real leader in this space. So they have organized around four different issue areas and they're having four stakeholder engagement summits. I think they just had their second one uh, yesterday. And so the, the Secretary of Education sort of came in there and said, look, you know, we don't have a plan in our back pocket that we want you all just to kind of step in and approve. And, you know, this is not a check the box kind of activity, but, you know, let's start broadly, you know, really hear from you what matters and then coordinate uh, to, on plan development and, and implementation. Okay, thank you for that. Um, well, the districts, you talked about districts having a seat at the table. So far, do your members feel like they have a seat at the table as these ESSA plans are developed? Um, and are districts doing sort of their own internal outreach to get a sense of what principals and, and school board members and other advocates um, that are part of their district, what they want to see in state plans and in, and in some of the district um, implementation? So at the risk of giving a very DC answer, the reality is, is that that varies. That is a function as much of is your state legislature in session this year to if your state legislature is in session, are they focused on this? So we have some superintendents who are very engaged in a state-led process that's very inclusive. I know that Maryland has convened uh, a working group around ESSA that includes both state agency staff as well as representation from a variety of stakeholder groups. We also have other states where uh, in Indiana, for example, our state affiliate, they work together as, with as a superintendent's association to identify what it is they were looking at, what was in their waiver that they wanted to keep, what was in their waiver that they needed to get rid of, what weren't they able to in their waiver that they thought would be beneficial as a possible under the ESSA flexibility. And from that, that, that's a document they're using to reach out to other education groups to see where their common ground is. And then from there, they, that, that includes conversations with the state board of ed, with the state governor, with the state chief, with the state agency. And you see everything in between. You see some superintendents who feel very involved. You see some who think they're involved, but it seems more like in, uh, inclusiveness for the sake of inclusiveness, but truly covering the full gamut. Thank you. Um, so one of the biggest changes under ESSA is that state systems not have to include an indicator of school quality or student success. That could be something like school climate, student engagement, teacher engagement, something else that the state comes up with. Um, Peter, do you have a sense yet of what kind of indicators states are thinking about including? Um, and do you anticipate challenges in measuring these new kinds of factors, factors like student engagement, and sure they're disaggregated by subgroup, which is a requirement um, under the ESSA regulation? Thanks, Allison. You know, so this is an area where I think we're fielding a lot of questions for states, and there is sort of some uncertainty in many states as to sort of how to proceed. You know, particularly sort of as we you know, continue to analyze the statutory language and then the new proposed regulations on accountability. Um, so folks are still sort of considering their options. I mean, we've definitely heard from states some interest in sort of looking at participation in advanced coursework, and you know that's a measure that's tracked in many states now. But also, you know, looking at things like school climate surveys. Um, there are a number of states that have sort of discussed that as being a necessary sort of indicator to show school success. And um, so, you know, it's not going to be sort of immediately clear, and there's some uncertainty, particularly until we see sort of final regulations. And I think you're right in in noting that you know the statute does you know require that the indicators be sort of valid, reliable, and, and comparable. It has to be disaggregated uh, under the proposed regulations. Um, they have to yield sort of improved academic achievement or improved graduation rates. So like as we sort of put more guardrails on there, you know, what sort of remains I think will be an interesting question that we'll face, you know, particularly when the regs go final. Thank you, Peter. Um, Noelle, is there anything in particular that your members have talked about wanting to see measured? Um, and are there superintendents who are worried their schools are going to be on a hook for factors that are really beyond their control? I haven't heard any superintendent express concern about a factor that's outside of their control. I think what they're really excited about is the fact that the focus on both academic and non-academic factor recognizes and empowers state and local education agencies to develop accountability systems to reflect that a child is more than a test score and that there are a variety of circumstances that will impact how a child is able to learn, achieve, and perform that warrant consideration. So there's absolute 
there could there could be the concern that perhaps the state will make a, um, a a lateral decision on their own without stakeholder input, but we haven't heard any explicit reports of that. I have not heard from any superintendents any deep concern against any specific indicator, and they're just excited about the opportunity to have the entirety of the child's environment and how that is out and what they're able to do in school reflected beyond just a single test score. Yeah, so speaking of testing, um, we're getting a lot of questions coming in about the innovative assessment pilot, um, which ESSA creates. So Peter, do you have a sense of ballpark estimate of how many states might um, apply for that pilot, or at least is this a big topic of discussion and interest among your members? You know, it's a, a very big sort of topic of conversation, and so we have um, actually many more than seven states who have sort of expressed some general interest uh, in looking at it. Um, but I think a lot of states are also recognizing that, you know, it's a sort of pilot authority, but, you know, it doesn't can carry with it sort of additional federal funding. And so there, there has to be a lot of sort of capacity building at the state level to sort of even think about kind of moving this. and. I think one of the things that we have been sort of telling states generally as they think about the pilot is, you know, are there elements that are sort of potentially contained within the pilot that you can also do sort of without necessarily formally participating in the pilot? You know, so for example, you know, having kind of uniform interim assessments or, you know, better integrating measures of career readiness or sort of competency-based measures into the accountability system indicators. Um, or sort of looking at folios as an element of an accountability system, student portfolios where you're sort of collecting student work and sort of showing skills and competencies. So I think it, it reflects sort of a lot of interest in sort of moving forward in the assessment window, and I think some of that will result in states applying for the pilot, though folks are really waiting for the assessment uh, regs to be finalized. and. I think I saw we had a question that, that the, the Department of Education is intending to finalize the regulations by the end of this year. And I think if we see regulations on the innovative pilot that are too tight, that's probably going to chill a lot of states' interest in, in actually applying for it. Huh. Um, Noelle, is this something that your members have talked about? Because obviously it would be a district. This pilot would start out at the district level. Um, I also wanted to ask you about another piece of ESSA, which you can answer kind of these two questions together. ESSA does allow um, high schools, uh, districts, to um, use a different test um, with their high schools. So a college entrance exam like the SAT or ACT, has that generated interest among your members? The short answer is yes. And when we look at what both of those testing pilots represent, both the one that is the state ability to create its own assessment and the local flexibility to use a nationally recognized assessment, those are flexibilities in the way students are assessed. One of the things I get a lot of feedback on from the superintendents is that as a reauthorization, ESSA itself does not reduce the number of federally required tests. The reality is we know that a child takes many more tests than just those required by federal statute. Uh, but at the end of the day, those are tests that are required either by state or local policy. And so as much as there are federal tests that are given, when we talk about the significant number of tests that students are taking, when we look at this um, rightful concern that we want to ensure our students aren't over-tested and that the tests being taken are meaningful, I think a lot of the precautions that are in place in ESSA help ensure or make more likely that the tests that are being given in response to a federal requirement are more meaningful. And I think it's very important to look at that while it's not super robust, there is both statute and fiscal resources related to supporting an audit or technical assistance around looking at what state and local assessments are being given. Now to the pilot, there's absolutely an interest in looking at what a state could design because the state is going to be better positioned to know what a test can and should look like and what will and will not work for the students in that state and how it aligns to the standards. For the local high school flexibility, for the one where they can choose an SAT or an ACT or perhaps work with their state to get another one that might be aligned to some of the work they're doing in the CTE space, that is something that gets a lot of raised eyebrows when I mention it in my presentations across the country because it's looking at using a test that they know they're going to give, a state accountability test, but an opportunity to perhaps make it a test that would be more meaningful or have multiple purposes, killing, multiple, killing two birds with one stone, if you will, and it's definitely something they're interested in. I haven't heard much beyond that, though. Okay, thank you. 
Um, moving on to another topic, teacher evaluation. Um, under SS states are allowed to stop doing teacher evaluations um, that rely at least in part on a student test scores. That was a requirement under waivers. Peter, do you have a sense of how many states um, will cease doing these evaluations? Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, I think we'll see significant variation, and I would sort of point out here, you know, that there continues to be a statutory, or there is a statutory requirement now that um, states have to demonstrate that low-income and minority students are not disproportionately taught by ineffective, out-of-field, and inexperienced teachers. So those terms, the ineffective, out-of-field, or inexperienced, are not sort of codified the definitions within statute, nor are they would they be codified under the proposed regulations that, that we've seen. So um, I think you will, we will start to see states sort of moving in different directions. Um, I think one thing that I would not expect is that states would kind of return to the kinds of practices that existed, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. I, I think, you know, one of the things that will certainly remain from the recent kind of discussions around teacher evaluation will be sort of a focus on teacher performance and sort of teacher's impact upon students. Now, I think that those could be measured in, in various different ways. So I think we'll see, uh, I think, different things coming out, and it'll be interesting to see kind of which um, demonstrate kind of a greater impact uh, in the field. Now, have you, um, do you get a sense of whether some districts might want to stick with this, pro this process of um, evaluating teachers based at least in part on test scores, even if um, it's not required at the state level? The, the answer I wanted to give is yes, and uh, well, yes and ditto. I think Peter answered it very articulately, and I think what we saw in some of the backlash against teacher evaluation under No Child Left Behind, especially as it was uh, grown exponentially through, through the waivers and through Race to the Top, was that we were using test data from assessments that weren't designed to be used for teacher evaluation. I think that's a lot of the tension. So to the extent that ESSA removes some of the pressure to use a test that's designed for student achievement to be used now for teacher evaluation, removing that pressure alone makes it much more likely and much more reasonable that a state and a local agency will continue to work on teacher evaluation. I've never had a school superintendent indicate that they don't want to evaluate their teachers. But uh, I don't see them wanting to drop it outright. Yeah, that makes sense. So we're getting a lot of questions about the regulatory process, um, and you both have mentioned this um, in your remarks. Uh, we've seen regulations um, through negotiated rulemaking on assessments, um, a proposed regulation on accountability. We're still waiting for regulations, as you all have said, on innovative assessments, and there has been um, a lot of controversy and action around regulations for supplement, not the plant. So I'm wondering sort of if you could each give me your overall take um, starting with Peter um, on the regulatory process and, and what you're watching there. Thanks, Allison. And yeah, I mean, you raised the supplement, not the planned issue, um, you know, which has been a, sort of an arcane fiscal rule for many years, um, has never sort of generated this level of sort of attention and controversy as we're sort of seeing now. Um, and, uh, you know, basically the, the department put a proposal on the table in the negotiated rulemaking that would have required sort of per pupil funding to be sort of equalized between all Title I and non-Title I schools. And I think it's a sort of a well-intentioned proposal, but one that sort of, you know, fails once it uh, sort of gets put into practice because, um, you know, state and local systems are, are very sort of complex and you know, we clearly kind of support the, the sort of equitable sort of principle here, but, you know, when you're talking about, you know, equalizing teacher salaries, which are, you know, subject to collective bargaining in a number of areas, or sort of equalizing district-wide spending, you know, like reality starts to intrude on in some of these questions. So, you know, for example, if one school is farther away than another, you know, does that mean that the, the in equalizing funding that you can't have bus routes that actually go to the full school? or you know, if there's a teacher who has a family and has insurance, um, health insurance for his or her whole family, you know, that's going to elevate the cost of that teacher in a particular school. So um, I think we're, we're hopeful that we'll sort of reach a, a solution that will promote equity in a way that actually sort of benefits children, and um, but we'll sort of have to see kind of where that controversy goes. You know, do you want to talk a little bit about the regulatory process from your perspective? 
Yeah, absolutely. So we might have a thousand delegates of more than eight years to get over the finish line, but the regulations are really where you help provide some additional clarification. When it comes to ESSA implementation, though, and we talk about regulations, I think it's really important that we talk about the three sets of resources that the Department of Ed has at its disposal to provide additional clarification. There are regulations, which carries with it almost the weight of law. There's guidance, non-binding guidance, and then there's technical assistance. And I think it's really important that any additional information made available by the Department of Ed is consistent with the spirit and intent of ESSA. And given that the bill or the law is so focused on state and local control, we would encourage the Department of Ed to continue down a path of issuing regulations when there's consensus beyond what is required in statute from the state and local education agency. Uh, we were pleasantly surprised by what they put forward with accountability. We are always most interested in the deals or the agreement that can be reached through the negotiated rulemaking process that was led by stakeholders. So that's, that's a comment on the assessment piece. But when we look at guidance and technical assistance, a role I think the Department of Ed could really, really excel at is based solely on the number of references to evidence-based. And this actually dovetails with something Peter said related to supplement, not supplant. I don't think I've ever talked to an educator who doesn't understand the importance of equity and really ensuring that all students have access to highly effective teachers. But what they struggle with is how to make that work, and how to make that work when you live in a community where the teachers that you have access to or the teachers that you're able to attract to apply to your school might not be the most highly effective. And what would be most useful to you, instead of a regulation requiring something that you already know you want to work on, is technical assistance on what are the practices that can make that a reality. How do I actually do, how do I, as a school district with 85% free and reduced lunch and chronic first year teacher turnover, how do I work to stabilize my teacher recruitment and retention in a meaningful way? What are some of those proven practices? And that's a really good strength of the Department of Ed. I would also highlight that the, the prevalence of the phrase evidence-based. Every school, every district, every state has access to a lot of information but there's a lot of other information across the nation that they don't even know that they don't know about. And if there's anyone that's really very well positioned to create a clearinghouse of information around ESSA-related practices and to really help clarify what might meet the various levels or tiers of evidence-based, it's the Department of Ed. And I'm not talking about the What Works Clearinghouse. That, that is a bigger, separate conversation. But I, I really want to highlight the importance of the role of the Department of Ed, not only in regulations, but also in non-binding guidance and technical assistance. Now, to talk about the third and final one on supplement, not supplant, AASA is very much in the similar position of that of CCSSO. The focus on equity, the focus on ensuring that all students have access to highly effective teachers is an absolute priority. I mean, it's a strong parallel to the underlying underlying tenet of ESSA, which is to help level the playing field for the students in poverty. What we have concerns with, though, is when you look at a forced calculation of per pupil expenditures, that is assuming that a school district is able to completely control for every factor that impacts how teachers sort themselves out. And beyond what Peter talked about in terms of labor contracts, union presence, there's issues like First-year teachers who are single want to live in a different community than teachers who have been married for 10 years and have three, three children of their own. There's just a variety of factors that influence teacher sorting patterns that are beyond the absolute control of a school district. And to the extent that a school district cannot control for those, the requirement of equalized or absolutely equal dollar-for-dollar dollar comparison is at a disconnect. So we're very much looking forward to moving forward, and we remain optimistic that the proposal the Department of Ed will start with will reflect a very thoughtful and deliberate conversation of the negotiated rulemaking committee. Thank you, Anya. Um, so you both talked a little bit about um, the evidence-based interventions um, that are going to be required under ESSA. Um, as you both know, and as probably a lot of folks in our audience knows, um, ESSA turns over responsibility for turning around low-performing schools um, and schools where subgroups are struggling to states and districts. Um, how do you expect that your members might proceed here? What, do you think that they'll continue doing some of the things that they did 
under No Child Left Behind, or do you think they're going to head in a really different direction here? Um, I'll, I'll sort of jump off here in that, you know, school improvement is one area where I think, as I noted earlier, there's just much more sort of flexibility at the local level, um, both in terms of the comprehensive support and improvement, so the sort of bottom 5% in the high schools with the sort of largest uh, dropout rates in the state, um, and then the targeted support and improvement schools where there's sort of just one or more subgroups that are performing at a particularly low levels, even though the school is performing uh, sort of adequately. Um, so there's the requirement that uh, sort of school leaders convene stakeholders, you know, engage in uh, sort of some planning, you know, develop and implement sort of some evidence-based strategies, um, and really sort of have much more authentic interventions and plans at the local level. Um, but there are some sort of questions, and this is not a, a practice to which I think folks at the state or local levels are kind of much accustomed. And you know, we've been at CCSSO trying to help sort of unpack the sort of federal statutory requirements and then also present resources that folks could use. Um, there are some new sort of proposed regulations on this that has to be the highest level of um, evidence that's available sort of to the extent practicable. And also the intervention has to have evidence that it works in the intended population to the extent practicable. And I think um, folks aren't necessarily prepared right now to go um, online or wherever to find exactly where that is. Um, but that's potentially an area also where states can present some resources to districts to think about interventions that are evidence-based and successful. Do you want even anything to add to that? The only thing I would add is a little bit more granular, and that's just the timeline by which the plans have to be implemented and the timeline by which you have to identify schools as in need, as, as needing the comprehensive support. And this is something that will play out in the back and forth discussion around the accountability regulations. Because if school districts have to be identified or if, if those schools in need of the comprehensive supports have to be identified by the start of the 17-18 school year, I think it's highly unlikely that we'll have a lot of states that will have their full system up and running, which begs the question, are they identifying based on ESSA data or NCLB data? And if they're going to have to be identifying under NCLB data and they're not going to have a lot of room to revamp, how much are they going to move their structure from NCLB? So we really want to be mindful that in the, when we talk about the timeline for implementation, we're deliberate in ensuring that state and local education agencies have time to fully implement the system before using the data from the system. Um, and that's just as a way to help put a stronger foundation so that the bill can be implemented more successfully. Thanks, Noelle. So we're getting a lot of questions about students in special education and what kind of changes ESSA makes for them and what are the challenges for states and districts in, in implementing um, some of those changes. So um, I'll start actually with Peter so we can talk a little bit about um, changes for this population of students. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Allison. And you know, so obviously, you know, the ESSA is not the is not the IDEA, so which you know contains sort of many more requirements. But I think that there are some very important sort of provisions that were preserved within ESSA, sort of vis-a-vis -vis NCLB, and also some sort of tweaks to those provisions. Um, so I think it was an open question, sort of in earlier stages of the reauthorization, as to you know whether students with disabilities would sort of continue to be assessed and continue to be sort of disaggregated as a subgroup. And uh, at the end of the day, and this was a, a provision that PCSSO generally supported, you know, was that um, you know, students with disabilities will continue to be assessed. And there's also, you know, the continuation around the alternate sort of assessment, although actually those provisions were a little bit changed. So under NCLB, or really under regulations uh, that were promulgated under NCLB, um, states could use an alternate assessment aligned with alternate achievement standards um, and could only count 1% of those assessments or 1% of the student body's assessment um, for proficiency purposes, for accountability. Um, actually, ESSA then says you can actually only deliver, only administer the assessments to 1% of students. So, um, so you know, that is going to potentially set up some challenges in the intersection between IEP teams that have sort of traditionally been, you know, charged with figuring out the supports that, that students need and the sort of academic programming, including assessments, and um, this sort of new federal requirement that only 1% of kids statewide can get the assessment. So 
Um, we're providing some supports to states as how they can think about sort of coaching up IEP teams and, um, you know, fairly, you know, how to deal with this kind of um, the, the increased limitation around the universe of students who can be assessed here. Well, do you have anything to add on students in special education? No, the only thing I would echo based on what Peter referenced was the adjustments to how alternate assessments are treated. And it is a 1% cap on participation, but it's a statewide average. And we think that's an important change because what it does is it ensures that each school district is considered individually. And so if you find a district that has an identification rate of 0.6%, that's fine. But if you're a school district that has a high, higher percentage rate, or perhaps you've built out a strong program for serving students with disabilities, word of mouth will get you more students who need those services. And if you have rightfully, as determined by your IEP team, an identification rate of 1.2%, that can also be okay as the state works to ensure that a statewide average is just at or below 1%. Uh, so we're optimistic about what some of this flexibility looks like, and we'll continue to watch how it rolls out. Thanks, Noelle. So we've gotten a lot of questions submitted about parent involvement and what kind of changes ESSA makes in that area, how it might um, improve parent involvement um, as opposed to how it was under MTLD. Yeah, I think there are sort of a number of opportunities, and you know, particularly as we look at the development of state and local ESSA plans. I mean, we've already sort of gone over the stakeholder engagement provisions in the statute, and you know, I think most states are engaging with organizations representing parents and sometimes with parents sort of individually um, in the development of their plans. Um, but then also, you know, particularly as we're looking at sort of supporting underperforming schools. So, you know, parents uh, have to be involved in the development and the implementation of the new school improvement plans. Um, so those aren't the only hooks, but those are, you know, two potential really useful ones to make sure that parents are sort of engaged throughout the process. Uh, Noelle, did you have anything to add? I wouldn't add much more there. The one thing I would point to, though, is being mindful of the inclusion of parents in the stakeholder process, because it is so local in terms of assets compared to No Child Left Behind. So as you look at your various stakeholder tables, just being mindful of ensuring that at least some parent voice is there. Okay, thank you both. Um, we have time for one question. I'll ask you to keep your answers to this pretty brief. Um, it's clear, obviously, that ESSA gives more power to um, states and districts. Um, do you have any concerns about state and district capacity to use this new authority? I mean, I, I think um, Noel kind of referenced this a little, a little bit earlier, is that it almost sort of reflects a culture change as much as it does um, sort of a capacity constraint, although that's certainly sort of part of it. Um, so I think one of the opportunities is to sort of examine what's working, what's not, and to sort of look to de-silo programs. And there's uh, sort of new consolidated state plan proposals um, that the department has made that would potentially sort of facilitate that. Um, but then ultimately, you know, to, I think it, it allows much more sort of agency and authority at the state and local levels, and that's kind of going to be necessary for folks to develop and kind of own the systems. Um, but yeah, as Noel had referenced earlier, we're quite aware that you know the success or the failure of activities under this law is going to rest with us, and we can't sort of blame the federal government as much as as had happened in the past. That's fair. Uh, Noel, do you have anything to add to that? I do not. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and now um, we're going to go into some housekeeping. Um, we want to remind you that if you'd like to watch today's pre um, presentation again, um, an on-demand um, archive will be made available through edweek.org um, within the next four hours. Um, you can also visit edweek.org to find articles that explore today's topic. Um, but before we conclude, um, we want to go to a quick message from our sponsor, Measure Progress. Measure Progress is proud to sponsor Edweek's coverage of ESSA because for us, it's all about student learning. A not-for-profit organization, Measured Progress is a pioneer in authentic, standards-based assessments for all students. Our mission is to provide meaningful information to measure student progress to improve teaching and learning. We connect the K-12 educational community with innovative and flexible assessment solutions. We built our reputation for excellence in large-scale assessment. We provide service to 20 states, partnering with departments of education to create meaningful statewide solutions. 
Measured Progress is also known for its leadership in alternate assessment for students with severe cognitive disabilities. We've worked with more than half the states since 1998 to develop and implement valid measures for these students in both portfolio and performance formats. Our district and classroom solutions are built on the same foundation of precision and technical expertise that our large-scale assessments are known for. More than 175 districts use the Measured Progress Formative Content Bank for access to premium assessment items and quizzes in reading and math, built to college and career readiness standards and aligned to state standards that help teachers gather evidence of student learning to inform instruction. Pre-configured testlets and benchmarks provide a range of differentiated content to monitor instructional pacing, pacing and effectiveness. For science, STEM gauge formative assessment resources include topic-based item sets and teacher tools to help districts transition to the higher rigor of next generation science standards. Measured progress provides customized services such as developing benchmarks based on a district's unique scope, sequence, and pacing, and help grow local capabilities through expert review and scoring training to make an immediate impact on student learning. Looking to the future, Measured Progress is expanding the comprehensive assessment system called Empower Assessments from the state level to include districts nationwide. Developed in consultation with the College Board, Empower Assessments provide a unified solution for interim and year-end summative assessments for grades three through high school with a predictive connection at eighth grade with the SAT suite of assessments. Empower assessments provide valid and reliable results to help administrators measure growth during the year and year to year. All in all, what drives us at Measure Progress is to improve teaching and learning. We do that by providing customizable assessment products and educational services and build on the expertise and insight gained over the past 30 years. We are a diverse group of psychometricians, assessment designers, content developers, technology specialists, and operations experts. We use these talents to deliver exceptional value for customers through a collaborative approach. That's what we call the Measured Progress Difference. Connect with us on social media or at measuredprogress.org to start the conversation today. Thank you, Measured Progress. Um, I'd also like to thank Peter and Noel for their participation today, and thank you all for attending. Um, I know we didn't get to every question that was submitted, um, but you all gave me a lot of ideas for future stories um, and blog posts, um, so I really appreciate that. We'll try to look into some of your unanswered questions.